we've arranged this music so that it can be played in the Western classical tradition. Uh, the music is now actually available. It wasn't available all these years, last 40 years, last 50 years, it wasn't. So it was basically our task to transcribe this. Um, of course, there's the end result, as you know, is this book. So I'll briefly tell you the story of this book. You've probably read about it on the internet or in the newspapers, so you don't have to um, be bored by the whole thing. I'll just tell you the rationale behind it. Um, the Mandos, the Dulpas, and the Deknis, which are from our great past, have generally been well documented. We had a couple of uh, um, uh, people like Andre Shet, who passed away about 40 years ago. He collected a whole bunch of uh, these uh, Mandos. In fact, most of the Mandos. Um, the Mandos are about 250 years old, and um, the last collection of them was, I think, in 1950, by Andre Shet, who was actually from Shoran. Um, I think in the end he settled in Kojue. And um, he handed over the copyright of all those uh, mandos to um, Dr. Lawrence, um, Dr. Lawrence Nerona of Vienna. And Dr. Lawrence has actually handed over the copyright to me. So the copyright for all the mandos, which is not extant today because they are they pass the statute of limitations, uh, lies with me as such. But you know, it's, there is no copyright that can be held that anybody can copy the mandos. But uh, the copyright for these, of course, is currently with Beta Publications. Okay. Now, uh, what's happened to the music of the last half century? You know there's been some really, really great musicians. Alfred Rose, for example. Uh, he was more of a singer. Uh, and some, quite a lot of his songs were very interesting musically. Uh, but I think the composer who's really shaken the uh, company world in the last 50 years has been Frank Fernand. Frank Fernand is from Kuchurim. Uh He was an amazing musician, and his arrangements have been posit positively stupefying. Uh, he passed away about seven years ago. Uh, Chris Perry passed away also a few years ago. Sorry, uh, Frank Fernand passed away a couple of years ago. Chris Perry seven years ago. Um, so when they passed away, and Mandel and Fonso passed away about 40 years ago, this tradition was lost uh, because none of them actually documented the music. None of them actually put down the notes for the music. I did have a couple of um, transcripts of Manuel Alfonso's music. Uh, a long time ago, which he scribbled down for the movie Sukhache Sopon. I no longer had them, so I've had to transcribe them again. So. The music of the last half century, it's not available to a Western musician to play. It's not available to somebody to play in the West. So something had to be done about that. Now, of course, our tradition, basically, uh, as we're gathered here today, is mostly going to be Goan music. But the rationale behind this book is Konkani music. Now, Konkani is spread throughout the diaspora. That's Konkani spoken in Goa and Mangalore, right? Okay. Uh, somehow they don't empathize quite a lot, but one has to admit, that the music from Mangalore is pretty amazing too. We've had some amazing composers from Mangalore, uh, some singers, previous singers of us, but of course the giant is Wilfie Remembers, and Henry de Souza too. So, all of these have found a place in the book. And all of these, along with some other music from the diaspora, even Swahili music and Portuguese music, has found a place in this book. Why did we transcribe them? Of course, we transcribed them to make them musically available for the musicians to play, but also because it's a part of our culture. And we have a lot of emigration going on today. Lots and lots of Goans are going out from here, from Goa, from Mangalore, from the Konkan Belt. They move to the ships, they move to the West, to the UK, US, Canada. Uh, they have kids who have kids and the second generation and third generation immigrants. Um, somewhere down the line, this tradition is lost, our language and our music. And kids from the third generation or second generation, they only hear their grandparents singing, you know, like, Okay, and the grandparents sing this, and the kids are like, oh, that's a pretty tune. Can you teach it to me? But of course, the grandparents, really, there is no music available for that. So the grandparents can't really teach the, the child. So they can hum the tune. So the child goes to music class and says to the teacher, hey, man, can you teach me this song? And she's like, what, what song? And she, she hums it, ha, 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 And the teacher says, can you bring me the music? And she's like, no, it's my grandparents sing this song. And uh, so Jesus says, unless you really have the notes, the music, I can't teach you the song. So this book seeks to address that problem for the <coughs> diaspora, for the future generations, you know, third, fourth generation down the line. Okay, we are trying to preserve our tradition. And this is really a massive project. We are trying to go in for like 600 basic songs out of the 40, 50,000 that are available. Uh, recorded concrete music has only about 20,000 songs, out of which uh, 5,000 belong to Alfred Rose, which is a very interesting statistic. Okay. Um, what was the transcription process like? You know, how did we transcribe these songs? That was a very interesting process. Transcription, and quite a lot of you here are musicians, right, from uh, Miss Figueredo. 
uh, uh, transcribing is extracting the melody from the orchestration, from the recorded version, and it's like extracting gold from bass ore. It's a pretty difficult process, uh, because you've got to get it absolutely right. Just like writing English, just like writing grammar, syntax, there's at least a dozen ways to do it. You've got to do it exactly right. And what do we mean by exactly right? It's not just got to be the music per se, the notes, you know, ba 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 ba. You've got to get the accents right. Because music is a language like any other language. It has its grammar, its syntax. It's got its accents, which actually have to fall exactly on the beat. Okay, so that was very important. Another problem that arose, of course, was that there's two, three versions, sometimes four or five versions of the same song, and the accents are displaced sometimes, so we had to do a composite there. But by and large, we worked with a whole lot of musicians and a whole lot of software, industrial strength software, and we got the music exactly right. How do I know we got it right? Well, because we're, that's presumptuous, but we ran it by a whole bunch of musicians, we ran it by the Royal Conservatory, and we tested it out, and when the software was reverse engineered back, Against the recording, it played it absolutely perfectly. Okay, that was just the sheet music part of it. Um, this book has um, a compendium for each song. I believe that when you learn something in school or you try to memorize something, the only way you can actually memorize it is by using all five of your senses. Or, in the case that you have cerebral um, access to cerebral senses, all six of your senses. <laughs> like if you're cutting an apple, the only way you can really enjoy it is if you smell it, taste it, feel it. Okay, you know you're enjoying it. So I felt the same rationale had to be followed in transcribing this music. You don't just write the words there and say, or write the notes there and say, hey, here's the music, you've got to play it. The reader, the performer, has to know everything about that song. If, for example, the very first song in this book is Adios from Boyran Flamunis, which is a very interesting song. Uh, Boyron Thermonis, I'm sure you probably know, means caveman, okay? It was a 1977 film from Chris Perry and Tony Pereira, and it involved uh, the story of a man who lived in a cave, and, you know, he was like, yeah, he had this kind of baser instincts. Uh, but the music was really excellent by Chris Perry, and in this particular song, he moans, you know, that, that, uh, the loss of his love and stuff like that. Now, if you read just the notes, there's nothing you can really get about it, okay? We had to get the accents ex absolutely right. So step two was to be able to play it for somebody who doesn't read music, somebody who just strums a guitar. So we had to put in the chords, and we had to get the chords exactly right. Okay, so we've got two of the senses working here. But then, what about somebody who doesn't even know the guitar, who doesn't even know any harmonic instrument like the accordion or the piano? So we had to transcribe it just for lyrics. We had just the lyrics, and we put the chords in there. Now, uh, what about the third generation immigrant? He doesn't know what it means. Okay, uh, if I had to ask you a sentence from this book, I'm sure you, some of you would be able to translate it pretty well. We have some pretty good scholars here. Do you want me to test you? <laughs> yeah. All right, I'll just tell you what we did. We took the lyrics and we rhymed them. We translated them and then we rhymed them. Why did we rhyme them? For two reasons. First of all, it's poetic. I mean, if you're expecting the public to buy your product, you, we need to take more trouble than the ordinary writer. Okay, I'll give you the example of that very first song that I was talking about. Uh, Adios from Boyron Vimonis. It's a very interesting song. Okay, I'm sure you know what that means. At least some of you know what it means. All right, I'll tell you what it means. Okay, uh, it's about, you know, the words that were spoken and they still remain in your mind. But then the next line goes, So the words... Uh, the love flowed away like water. Now we had to get these two sentences to rhyme, okay, and still retain the meaning. So this is a problem, not just in music, but in our culture, in any, it's a problem for any translator. A translator has immense amount of problems. He's got to get it exactly right. And yet, somebody reading this must not look up above it and say, okay, this is what it means. Ulole means uh, uh, my mind. It doesn't mean my mind. It means the word that is spoken. So, you know, somebody who doesn't know the language is going to look down below and try to translate it, so we had to overcome that obstacle. That is a problem common to all translators. And then we had to rhyme it. Uh, I hope you, it doesn't seem the difficulty we experienced at that stage. Now I'll just do these two lines for you. Ulele li utra mananto churon. And the first line, utkachi pori to mo mozo gelo varon. Now when we rhymed it, see how you find the rhyme. The words you spoke in my mind remain. My love like water streamed on in vain. Okay, it gives you, uh, hopefully, the exact meaning, but it also rhymes. Now, rhyming is not just like you 
quite often do in many languages, just getting the last words, you know, soji, boji, moji, and all, not like that. You can't just do that. When you rhyme, you've got to have rhythm and meter. So the rhythm and meter has got to be exact. Okay, so when I say, the words you spoke in my mind remain, if you're keeping the beat there, the second line should go exactly, my love like water streamed on in vain. And this is what we did for every single song in the book. Okay, we poured in an immense amount of effort to translate it, and to get exactly right, and to rhyme it. Okay, this was just the third facet of the song. The fourth facet was, people who don't read music, absolutely, people who have no idea about Konkani language, but they've heard this song, and they'd like to play it. Bands, bands throughout the world, they really love, you know, lots of Goan music. It's like baila to them. You know what's baila, right? Sri Lankan kind of music? Okay, so they want to play this kind of music, but they have no idea what the words mean, and they're not interested in the words. They want to play. They just want to play. And most of them read a form of music.